Hello. Hello and a very warm welcome to the platform of Biologically Speaking. It feels awesome to be back after a short break. We have a great lineup of speakers for the coming months. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can get timely updates. Thanks to all of you who are tuning in today to listen to today's webinar from all over the world. Your unwavering support has been pivotal in keeping us going. And we hope that it continues in future as well. So without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rohan Khadilkar from Tata Memorial Center, Advanced Center for Treatment Research and Education in Cancer. Dr. Khadilkar did his PhD from JNCSR Bangalore, working in the lab of Dr. Manisha Inamdar, looking into the role of a novel protein called Asrich in Drosophila hematopoiesis and blood cell homeostasis. His doctoral work won the best PhD thesis award in biological sciences at JNCSR for the year 2014-15. In 2015, he joined the lab of Dr. Tanenza for his postdoctoral work at the University of British Columbia. For his outstanding work throughout the years, he has received multiple awards, including the Indian National Science Academy Young Scientist Award in 2019 and Hargobind Khurana Innovative Young Biotechnologist Award for 2020-2021. Dr. Khadilka joined Tata Memorial Center in 2020 as Ramalinga Fellow. Not only a great researcher, Dr. Khadilka has an extensive training in Hindustani classical music as well. Dr. Khadilka, we are glad to have you today on our platform, and the screen is all yours. Uh, thanks, Shoradeep, uh, for inviting me firstly, and to the organizers, uh, organizers of Biologically Speaking seminar series. I think it's a great platform uh, for showcasing uh, your research and work. And I thank you for the opportunity to give me uh, a chance to talk to all of you today uh, on this forum. So what I'm going to quickly do is uh, I'll share my slide. Yeah, uh, I hope it's visible. So, um, the title of my talk is Stem Cell Niche Interactions in Shaping the Signaling Microenvironment and Implications of This During Development and Disease. And I'm going to tell you about two stories, essentially, that, uh, that I did in the recent past at University of British Columbia. And I would end up with what I am uh, doing currently at my lab at the Tata Memorial Center in Actric, uh, where I've been for a year now. And, uh, I hope that something exciting emerges out of this. So stem cell self-renewal and differentiation is balanced. There is a balance struck between stemness and differentiation, which leads to tissue homeostasis. Failure of either self-renewal or differentiation can either lead to a cancer-like scenario or tissue degeneration. So essentially what happens during tissue homeostasis is there is a balance that is struck between the, these two processes in order to maintain tissue homeostasis. And if you have any sort of aberrations in this particular process, it can wreak havoc in the tissue of interest that you're looking at. So one of the primary mechanisms by which uh, stem cell homeostasis or tissue homeostasis can be maintained is by the presence of a physical microenvironment called as the stem cell niche, which produces instructive signals that are not only required for the self renewal of stem cells, but they are also required for priming these stem cells towards differentiation. So essentially, the niche produces both kinds of signals. It produces pro-self-renewal signals which are required for renewing the stem cells, but it also produces signals that in turn are required for converting the stem cells to differentiated cells. So I think the niche is pro it provides it an ecosystem where a balance is struck between stemness and differentiation. But if situations go wrong or if there is a disease scenario, the niche and the stem cells can interact in a different way, leading to an abrupt amounts of differentiation or even decreased amounts of differentiation in some cases. So this is very context specific and I'm today going to talk to you about two such scenarios in my uh, presentation. So. There are different sorts of cell-to-cell -cell interactions and cell ECM interactions that are involved in maintaining tissue homeostasis. Now, cell-to-cell -cell interactions are primarily mediated by junctional molecules like adherence junctions, septate junctions, or gap junctions. And the cell-to-extracellular matrix connections are mainly mediated by cell ECM junction molecules. 
Now, the focus of the talk today is primarily going to be on septate junction molecules, which are the counterpart of tight junctions in the case of Drosophila. So these are the primary molecules which link two cells together. They're also called as tight junctions, like I said before. And the cell to ECM junctions are the ones that are required for maintaining the connection between the cell and the extracellular matrix that is present around the cell. So the focus of the talk today is going to be on septate junctions and the cell ECM junctions. Now the model system or the model organism that I primarily work on is Drosophila, uh, the advantages of which are shown on the left there. It firstly has a short life cycle. The generation time is less. It's about two weeks at 25 degrees Celsius. Genetic manipulation is possible. The gene, uh, the genome is, is annotated and very well characterized. The gene manipulation technologies available in flies are advanced. You can do a number of things. There are a lot of tools available in flies, which make it a great organ or a great model system for analyzing a number of things related to developmental biology as well as disease. Now, there is also conserved gene function wherein there are a lot of molecular similarities that exist between flies and the vertebrates. There are a lot of, in fact, there are a lot of molecules that were first identified in flies and they were then worked upon in the case of vertebrates. So flies, a lot of molecules, act, you can say, originated from the flies and that's where the knowledge originated from. The organ system that I've been looking at to understand tissue homeostasis is the lymph gland, which is shown here on the right. Now, the primary site of hematopoiesis uh, uh, is the lymph gland, and this is the primary lymph gland loop where the, all the action occurs, I can say. The, the structure here in blue is the posterior signaling center, which acts as a stem cell niche. The green zone here is the medullary zone, which houses the prohemocytes or the hematopoietic stem cells. And the cortical zone in red is the zone where the differentiated hemocytes are present. And the differentiated hemocytes in the case of Drosophila are plasmatocytes, crystal cells, and lamellocytes. And they have varied functions. Like the main response that is evoked by the hemocytes is the cellular immune response. And there is another kind of immune response called as the humoral immune response. And the two together make the innate immune response in the case of flies, which is primarily required for mounting uh, an immune attack against the invading pathogens. So like I said, there is a lot of conserved gene function. Even the Drosophila hematopoiesis uh, process bears a lot of similarities to the mammalian hematopoietic system. And hence, it serves to be a great model for uh, analysis and understanding biological function. So like I said in my earlier slide, there are three different kinds of blood cell types, plasmatocytes, crystal cells, and lamellocytes. And they bear similarities to the myeloid uh, blood lineage in the case of vertebrates, because there are a number of functions like phagocytosis, production of antimicrobial peptides, which uh, bear cytokine-like molecules, which bear similarities to the myeloid cell type. Uh, Drosophila doesn't have an adaptive immune response. They can't produce antibodies, just to be clear uh, on this note. And it has an open circulatory system. Uh, the hemocytes are released into circulation, and that's where they function from. And like I said, the other immune response is the humoral immune response, which is evoked by immune organs like the fat body and the Drosophila gut, where the antimicrobial peptides are produced. And the two together form the innate immune response. So the overarching questions that uh, we've asked here is how is the balance between stemness and differentiation maintained and how is it fine-tuned to, to maintain tissue homeostasis and whether or not cell junction molecules are involved in mediating intercellular communication which is involved in maintaining these processes. So like I said one of the primary mechanisms is by the presence of a stem cell niche but one of the modes by which this can occur is by formation of an isolating barrier. So what happens is there is an isolating barrier that is formed around the niche and the stem cells, a protective environment, as you can call it, which, you know, aids in self-renewal uh, self of the stem cells and it promotes the self-renewal of stem cells, thereby maintaining a balance between stemness and differentiation. So this, this could be one of the modes by which uh, the daughter cell fate decision can be uh, maintained by the stem cell niche. And one of the primary class of molecules that are required for formation of such an isolating barrier are septate junction molecules. 
Now, like I said, they are the counterpart of tight junctions in the case of inverted service to soft and hard. So septate junctions are located basally to the adherence junctions in the case of flies, whereas in the vertebrates, they are located apically to the adherence junctions. So they are functionally homologous to the uh, tight junctions. The core transmembrane component is Nurexin 4, and the intracellular binding partner of Nurexin is Coractin. So these are the two primary molecules that I'm going to talk about in the first part of my talk, Nurexin 4 and Coractin, and they are required for maintaining uh, organization as well as formation of septate junctions in the case of flies. So, uh, so what we did is firstly to understand whether stem cell, uh, the stem cell niche and the stem cells express these step, uh, septate junctions. So we looked at the entire organ and we stained it with this molecule called as coracle, which I said is one of the components of the septate junctions. So the structure you can see here is the primary lymph gland lobe and in red is coracle. If you look here, the, the, the region here highlighted is the green region, which is the stem cell niche marked by Collier GFP. So what we see is that it is largely uh, uniformly expressed in the entire primary lymph gland lobe, but it shows enriched expression, like high amounts of expression in the stem cell niche region, which is marked here in green. So what we could see is that coracle is enriched in the, uh, in the stem cell niche region, which led us to the conclusion that septate junctions are enriched in the stem cell niche region. We also performed electron microscopy to, uh, to specifically look at these septate junctions. And when we specifically isolated the stem cell niche region and performed electron microscopy on it, we could find the presence of these beautiful uh, pleated septate junctions, ladder-like arrangement, uh, which is why they're called as septate uh, between the niche cells. So uh, this was one of the things that was very striking and it got us really excited. And uh, we wanted to now look at the function of these septate junctions. Now, like I said, septate junction molecules, uh, they, are, they act as tight junctions. They are present. They are the main, uh, one of the main connections between uh, the cell to cell uh, intracellular communication. So they also allow transport of molecules. So we, what we did is we performed a dye assay. We performed a dual dye assay to identify what are the kind of molecules that can pass through these septate junctions and whether or not the septate junctions are maintaining a barrier because their main function is to maintain a barrier. And when, when the junctions are disrupted, that is when the uh, molecules which should not pass through the junctions can now pass. So what we did is if you look at the image here in the control, what we see is that 40 kilodalton uh, labeled dextran can, uh, can pass through the niche cells as well as the other, other parts of the lymph gland. Whereas 70 kilodalton cannot enter the niche cells. The marked region are the uh, cells of the stem cell niche in all the cases. Okay, So this is the control and we see that the 70 kilodalton dextran cannot enter the niche cells, whereas the 40 kilodalton can. So we did an overlapping, uh, we, uh, we quantitated the overlapping coefficient by quantitating the Pearson's co-localization coefficient and we find that there is not much co-localization between the two. But what happens when we deplete septate junction molecules, specifically in the stem cell niche? Now, Drosophila genetics allows you to perturb molecules in different uh, cellular populations because we have the availability of GAL4 lines, which can uh, enable you to perform uh, genetic perturbations in specific cell populations. So what we did is we performed RNAi for coracal and neurexin, specifically in the stem cell niche. And when we do that, what we see is that the 70 kilodalton dextran, which was, uh, which could not enter the stem cell niche region, could now enter the stem cell niche region in both the cases. And we find that the overlapping coefficient increases. That is the co-localization between the two dyes, which are labeled in red and green, now increases upon depletion of septic junctions. So what we see is that uh, the dye permeability assay that we performed to analyze whether the barrier is maintained or not, we can conclude that the uh, barrier breaks down upon knocking down uh, the septate junction components in the niche, which goes to show that the stem cell niche has the presence of an isolating barrier that is formed by the septate junctions. So we then wanted to analyze what is the importance of this barrier? Why is such a barrier existing, first of all? And we specifically see here that the barrier exists between somewhere between 40 kilodalton and 70 kilodalton. So we also wanted to narrow down uh, the molecular size uh, range between the two, but there was uh, the size sizes between these two weren't available to uh, perform the dye assay and narrow down the range even further. 
So we could find that there is a molecular cutoff between corticoid antenna and semi-decade. So what we did next is we looked at the stem cell population and the amount of differentiation in the mutants as well as the uh, in the lymph glands having uh, the knockdown of separate junction components in the niche. So when we did that, we firstly looked at the uh, stem cells, which are marked here by dome meso. So these are the prohemocytes or the hematopoietic stem cells, as you can call them. So we see that uh, in the case of the control, they're nicely adhered together. And we also find that the numbers are much more in the control as compared to the genotype here in B, wherein we knock down the septate junction components in the niche. We firstly find that they are lesser in number and they're also dispersed. You know, the attachment between the prohemocytes also loosens up and they, they seem to disperse in the lymph gland. So, uh, and when we look at the amount of differentiation, we see that the amount of differentiation is also upregulated. We see more amounts of plasmatocytes, which are marked here in, by the antibody P1, which is the marker for plasmatocytes, which is shown here in red. So we see that there are more, there is more amount of plasmatocyte differentiation as compared to the controls shown here in E. And we could also genetically rescue this. So the ideal way of looking at function of a particular gene is to do a complementation assay. So what we essentially did is we overexpressed uh, coracle specifically in the uh, in the lymph glands where the uh, where the coracle was mutated. So we what we we performed this assay essentially in the coracle mutants, and we replaced or overexpressed coracle specifically in the niche. And when we do that, we could see that the amount of differentiation that was present in the coracle mutants was now rescued which goes to show that uh, septate junction molecules are, are playing a very specific function in the niche by maintaining a isolating barrier. So we then wanted to mechanistically understand what is exactly happening in the lymph gland that is leading to more amount of differentiation. And like I said that the barrier is broken, which, we, which is what we observe uh, when we uh, deplete the septate junction. So what we did is we looked at one of the signaling pathways. So in the interest of time, I'm not showing you data from the other signaling pathways that we've looked at, but I'm presenting you data today about the BFP signaling pathway, which is one of the important signaling pathway that functions uh, in the maintenance of the niche. Uh, it is required for maintaining the niche size. So what happens in the control is, uh, so these are the niche cells marked in red by this ant ant antibody called as antinapedia. We, said, we see that the reporter uh, that is downstream of the BFP signaling pathway, that is DAD GFP, which is daughters against DPP. So you'll find all sorts of funny names in Drosophila. So bear with me or uh, just enjoy the names. So uh, DAD GFP uh, is specifically expressed in the niche and uh, it, its expression is restricted to the niche in the control scenario. So what happens when you knock down uh, septate junction molecules in the niche is the domain of expression of this reporter gets extended. So normally it is restricted to the niche, but when you knock it down, the domain of expression extends. So which goes to show that the signaling somewhere is abruptly affected in the case of uh, septate junction knockdown in the, in, in, in the niche. So it is affecting the signaling environment of the niche and the stem cells because in a normal scenario, it is restricted to the niche. But what is happening in, in the case of septate junction knockdown is its domain of expression is getting further extended on, which could be one of the reasons for increased amounts of differentiation that we observe in the lymph gland. So the natural question to ask here was, since the lymph gland is the primary organ that is involved in mounting a cellular immune response, like I said, it produces uh, differentiated blood cells that are involved in mounting a cellular immune response. We wanted to see whether infection has any sort of effect on the permeability barrier and separate junctions in the lymph gland. So what we did is we infected the larvae. We, uh, we did a systemic infection of the larvae. Uh, we pricked the larvae with uh, bacterial cultures and we looked at uh, the expression of the septate junction molecule coracle. So this is the sucrose control or the sham control, you can call it. And this is the bacillus subtilis uh, infected larvae. So the down regulation of coracle upon infection was very dynamic. We saw it as early as six hours post-infection. And we also saw that this translated in the barrier disruption. So we could see that the 70 kilodalton dextran, which is normally not able to access the niche cells, can now access the niche cells. And it very nicely translates into the amount of differentiation that we see post-infection. So which goes to show that infection is indeed affecting the permeability barrier in the lymph gland, in the niche. 
it is firstly down regulating coracle it's a dynamic down regulation of the septic junction molecule we see that the barrier is disrupted and it's leading to more amounts of differentiation so then it, it was a natural question to ask so there is more amount of differentiation so is it an advantage or a disadvantage to the fly because infection is leading to a down regulation and it's producing more amounts of these immune cells so we performed a survival assay we performed a, a standard survival assay of the fly, on the flies we took the control flies we took the flies bearing separate junction knockdown in the niche and we infected them uh, with bacillus subtilis so now uh, let me clear one thing here we performed both uh, gram positive and gram negative infection and it seems to be a pan uh, across the bacterial strains that we are uh, that we looked at we saw that there is barrier disruption and down regulation of septate junction components so it seems like a responsive molecule towards bacterial infection and in uh, regulating the permeability barrier so when we looked at the survival uh, of the flies uh, bearing septate junction depletion we see that the survival is much better as compared to the control which perish which perishes rapidly upon infection so it is giving the flies an immune advantage the loss of septate junction like we suspected that there is more amount of differentiation it is giving the flies actually an immune advantage so the next interesting thing or the exciting thing to do was to look at uh, deficient mutants of the immune pathways so uh, there are two primary immune pathways that were uh, you know discovered in flies that is the tall pathway and the imd pathway the tall pathway is specifically required for mounting a response against gram positive bacteria and the imd pathway is required for mounting a response against gram negative bacteria both of these are nf kappa b signaling pathways they signal to the nf kappa b transcription factors which ultimately uh, translocate to the nucleus and lead to the production of antimicrobial peptides which are very specific pathogen specific and also specific to uh, either the gram positive or the gram negative bacteria now there are a number of uh, immune deficient mutants that have been characterized earlier uh, in the field of uh, drosophila immunity and what we did is we created double mutants essentially trans heterozygotes of uh, the immune deficient alleles of each of the tall pathway and the imd pathway and we made double mutants of these with the septate junction mutant allele in order to uh, essentially disrupt the septate junctions and in turn disrupt the permeability barrier so when we created these double mutants and we then performed a survival assay so in, in the case of immune deficient mutants it is expected that when you infect them they are not able to mount an effective immune response and they perish so if you look at the red curve here and the purple one here you see rapid decline in survival upon infection but in the case of double mutants which are these four uh, curves here which are uh, so the again the names are funny uh, spatzla is one of the immune deficient alleles of the tall pathway and relish is one of the alleles of the imd pathway so if you take the spatzla mutant and club it to nurexin mutant and if you take the relish and club it to nurexin or also in the case of cora mutant allele in both the cases you see that the survival is much better as compared to the immune deficient alleles alone which shows that the immune deficiency if combined with the uh, loss of septate junctions or the malfunctioning of the septate junction is giving them an immune advantage as compared to the immune deficiency scenario so somehow their immune response is heightened in order to make make their survival ability much more as compared to the immune deficiency alone so this was really exciting because then this gives you a a molecule which can act as a switch during infection and can switch between maintaining hematopoiesis and maintaining an in, uh, mounting an effective immune response when there is an infection so it acts as a molecular switch essentially so we then wanted to we were of course interested in understanding what is the mechanism by which it is actually happening in the organism because all this action is happening in the lymph gland what happens to the circulating hemocytes because ultimately what happens in, during pupation is the lymph gland will break open it will release the hemocytes in circulation and then those are the hemocytes in circulation that ultimately act on the invading bacteria okay so what we did is we firstly looked at the number of circulating hemocytes what we find is that the number of circulating hemocytes are increased as compared to the control so this was done in larval stages as well as the adult stages and we see that uh, the number of hemocytes to start with are increased as compared to the control we then performed a phagocytosis assay that's a standard assay to look at 
uh, bacterial clearance. So we did an ex vivo assay as well as an in vivo assay where we GFP labeled the bacteria and we looked at the number of phagocytic events, uh, the uptake of uh, GFP labeled bacteria by these macrophage like cells, which are plasmatocytes. And we looked at the number of phagocytic events and we also see that the number of phagocytic events are up as compared to the control in both the coracle knockdown uh, lymph glands and urexin 4 knockdown lymph glands. We then performed an in vivo clearance assay wherein what we did essentially is we uh, we plated. Uh, so we, what we did is we took the infected flies, uh, the flies bearing uh, coracal knockdown and urexin 4 knockdown. We took bacteria that were antibiotic resistant and we then plated them and we counted the colonies uh, from both the control and the septate junction bearing depletion flies. And what we find is that uh, the number of colonies or the CFU colony forming units in the case of the uh, flies bearing septate junction depletion was much lesser as compared to the control, which goes to show that their in vivo clearance ability for the bacteria, invading bacteria is also heightened as compared to the control, which mechanistically shows that uh, septate junctions are uh, acting in the niche. They're essentially maintaining the barrier. When there is an infection, the barrier breaks down. It leads to increased amounts of differentiation. It is also controlling the number of circulating hemocytes. So it's essentially also con con probably controlling the proliferation, which we have not looked at yet, and which is one of the future aims of this project. And it's also controlling the amount of phagocytosis that occurs in these cells that you isolate from the septate junction bearing, uh, septate junction depletion bearing flies. So, which also goes to show that uh, somehow the phagocytic re receptors might be modulated by septate junctions, which again needs further investigation. So, to summarize this part of my talk, uh, I have put it up in a model wherein in a wild type or an uninfected scenario, the permeability barrier is nicely maintained. The molecules that are supposed to act in the niche or are required for stem cell renewal are uh, they are there in the niche because the niche is the sort of the nourishing uh, nourishing place for the stem cells which produces signals for maintaining this balance so the homeostasis is maintained but as soon as there is depletion of septate junction in the niche or if there is a scenario like infection what happens is the barrier will break down septate junctions are down regulated the barrier will break down there would be release of molecules that are normally limited to the stem cell niche so these these could be differentiating factors which can upregulate the amount of differentiation, leading to increased amounts of differentiated cells. So essentially, the septate junctions are acting as a molecular switch between developmental hematopoiesis and infection-induced hematopoiesis. So this study was published in eLife. And now I'm going to quickly switch gears. So this was a story about cell-to-cell -cell interactions mediated by septate junctions. The next story is about cell to ECM interactions mediated by integrins primarily. So here what we were interested to look at is how is the architectural framework of the niche stem cell ecosystem maintained? So we call it an ecosystem because it is, uh, it is complete in itself. The stem cell is the nourishing ground. Uh, stem cell niche is the nourishing ground which maintains the stem cells. And it uh, is required not only, like I said, for self-renewal, but also for uh, promoting differentiation. So it's a balance of signal. So there is a lot of interaction occurring between uh, these cell types for which we call it a miniature, miniature form of an ecosystem. So what we were interested to know is that whether there is an architectural framework that maintains this ecosystem. So one of the primary candidate molecules that can maintain such a framework is our ECM molecules because they are all around the cells. Uh, um, they provide a nourishing environment for the cells, not only for the stem cells, but they are also present around the stem cell niche cells because they are the primary molecules that make up the basement membrane. So we were interested to understand the function of cell to ECM junction molecules, which sort of communicate the signals from the extracellular matrix environment and communicate to the uh, communicate these signals to the inside of the cell. One of the key molecules that is involved in the communication of these signals from ECM to the inside of the cell are integrin molecules. And integrin acts as a heterodimer. There is an extracellular component and a cytoplasmic tail, uh, which is so there are different alpha subunits that associated that associate with a beta subunit, which then finally transduces the signal to the internal components in the cell. Uh, primarily called as the integrin adhesion complex. There are a number of molecules that form the integrin adhesion complex. Molecules like tailin, uh, 
uh, focal adhesion kinases, um, ILK, tensin, and there are a number of other kinases that form this integral adhesion complex. And these molecules, they transduce the signal in the, on the cytoplasmic side, and they communicate this signal to the actin cytoskeleton, which would then impinge on uh, transdu transducing these signals to the nucleus where the main action occurs. And integrin signaling is involved in a number of cellular processes, starting from proliferation, differentiation, migration, you name it, and you would find integrin in that particular process. It's such a such an important molecule, actually. So uh, what we did is we started by looking at uh, the expression of integrin as well as uh, the expression of ECM components in the lymphoid. So we looked at the expression of this molecule called as collagen, which is the primarily known ECM molecule, which is called as Viking in the case of guys. So we used a tagged line called as Viking and we looked at its expression in the lymph gland. So you can find a nice network of this ECM in the entire lymph gland actually, nice branch network of ECM. And these are the cells here in red, uh, which are the prohemocytes. So you can find a nice network of these uh, of this ECM around the stem cells. And we also find that Concomitantly, there is expression of beta integrin uh, around the stem cells. So we see nice expression of this beta subunit of integrin around the stem cells. So the, both the expression patterns go hand in hand together, wherein there is expression of uh, there is secretion or expression of the uh, of the collagen molecule, and we also find uh, expression of uh, beta integrin around the stem cells. So we could see that there is expression around the stem cells. We were interested to now understand. Uh, or rather uh, to understand and our hypothesis whether it is maintaining an architectural framework uh, around the stem cell and the niche. So what we did is we performed, uh, we did a targeted screen. There are five alpha uh, integrins in the case of Drosophila. And there's one beta subunit that associates with different alpha subunits and performs uh, its function in uh, different cell types in the case of Drosophila. So we did a targeted screen. We uh, knocked down different alpha subunits and the beta subunit in the prohemocyte specifically. What we find is that in the, in the case of prohemocyte, when you knock down the beta subunit or the second, the alpha PS2, we find that there is decrease in the amount of prohemocytes, which is also shown in the image here. We see that the number of prohemocytes are decreased upon knockdown of the beta subunit, which is the the gene name is myospheroid for the beta subunit, and we find that the number of prohemocytes are less as compared to the control. Concomitantly, we see that there is increased amounts of differentiation. So the two go hand in hand. There is decreased amounts of uh, prohemocytes, and there is increased amounts of differentiation, which is also quantitated here. We see that there is increased amounts of differentiation in both beta and alpha PS2 knockdown in the uh, prohemocytes specifically. So this got us interested and we found that the alpha subunit 2 is primarily functioning in the prohemocytes. We saw no effect of the other alpha subunits when we knocked them down in the prohemocytes. And definitely since there's one beta that can associated with, associate with the alpha subunit, we see uh, a same effect as we see when we knock down alpha 2 uh, as we see in the case of beta knockdown. So this, uh, we devised a technique to mechanistically look at what is exactly happening in the lymph gland. So we cultured the lymph gland uh, in an ex vivo culture and we, uh, you know, we got it working in, uh, in order to keep it alive for a number of hours so that we could perform some live imaging on it. So what you can see here are two movies. On the left is the control movie where you can see the ECM network marked in green, which is marked by Viking GFP. And the one, the cells in magenta are the prohemocytes. You can see that they are nicely lodged on and attached to the uh, the Viking uh, extracellular matrix network. What happens to it when you knock down uh, beta subunit or myospheroid in the prohemocytes? The first stark difference that we observed during this long-term imaging was that the ECM network seems to be reduced. The branching as well as the organization is completely different as compared to the control. We do not find the branching pattern that we observe in the control in the case of beta knockdown, uh, beta subunit knockdown in the prohemocytes. So we also performed some fixed staining, fixed uh, imaging on this, which is very apparent here. You see that the branching is nicely present in the control, whereas, whereas it is uh, drastically reduced upon beta subunit knockdown in the prohemocytes, which is also quantitated here. We use different sort of uh, tools in the image, say, uh, uh, the plugins essentially, 
to quantitate the density of ECM branches, we see that the density is reduced and also the amount of ECM assembly, which was quantitated by looking at the uh, fluorescence intensity is also reduced as compared to the control in, in, in the case of myospheroid knockdown and the prohemocytes, which goes to show that the ECM is getting affected when you, uh, when you uh, perturb integrin. So what we then did next is we tried to look at uh, what happens to the ECM in different genetic backgrounds. We, we took the ECM mutant allele, that is Viking mutants. We took the Viking mutation, Viking K00236, in which Viking, uh, Viking expression is affected. And we, we took a, a mutant where uh, there is overactivation of talin. It's an auto inhibition mutant, which makes talin overactive and it increases the amount of cell ECM adhesion. We see that the amount of ECM de deposited when you increase the amount of cell ECM adhesion is highly increased as compared to the control. Whereas if you perturb Viking in, the, in this case, where in, in the Viking you can see that the amount of ECM that is present is lesser as compared to the control. This also very nicely translates into the amount of differentiation, wherein you see that in the Viking mutant, the amount of differentiation is increased as compared to the control. Whereas in this case, it is not any different as compared to the control. The differentiation doesn't seem to be suppressed, but it is more or less similar to the Viking. So, which goes to show that the amount of ECM is really crucial to control the amount of differentiation in the nucleon. So, integrins, as we know, can function uh, in two different ways. So, we looked at two different arms of in, uh, the downstream signaling of integrins, uh, particularly to look at what they are doing in the lymph gland in order to maintain the ECM and to maintain the signals in the, uh, in the lymph gland. So we looked at direct downstream signaling and we also looked at whether integrins can regulate the signaling milieu around the prohemocytes in the lymph gland. So in terms of direct downstream signaling, we looked at one of the molecules called as uh, focal adhesion kinases, which like I said in my earlier uh, schematic is one of the molecules that mainly is there in the integrin adhesion complex and it functions on the cytoplasmic side uh, of uh, integrin and it is involved in the transduction of signals. So what we see in, in the case of uh, the active form of focal adhesion kinase, which is the phosphopac, we see that the phosphopac expression is nicely there present in the lymph gland around the prohemocytes in the control. But what happens in the case of missed knockdown or uh, beta integrin subunit knockdown is that the amount of phosphopac expression, which is the signaling uh, active form of fac is reduced as compared to the control. So there seems to be an effect on the PAC signaling when you deplete integrin in the prohemocytes. So now we performed an elegant assay, uh, epistatic interactions to look at what is downstream and whether or not PAC is indeed functioning uh, in the beta integrin signaling pathway in this particular context. So what we did is we essentially overexpressed PAC. We did this overexpression in the genetic background of integrin knockdown in the prohemocytes. When we do that, so if you look at the amount of differentiation here, uh, I'm sure you must be familiar with this by now that the, the, the amount of red cells present here, which are the plasmatocytes marked by P1, are increased upon um, this knockdown or beta integral knockdown in the prohemocytes. But when you overexpress PAC, the amount of differentiation is more or less similar to wild type, PAC alone. Whereas if you overexpress PAC in the missed knockdown background in the prohemocytes, you can nicely rescue the amount of differentiation, which goes to show that PAC is indeed acting downstream of integrin and it is functioning in the same signaling pathway. It is acting as a direct downstream regulator of integrin in controlling this particular phenotype of stem cell maintenance. So now we wanted to see whether uh, the signaling milieu is, uh, because one of the modes by which ECM can uh, integrin and ECM interaction can actually mediate signaling is by maintaining the signaling. Now there were reports that ECM molecules which are present in a meshwork like pattern, a branch pattern, they can actually trap ligand molecules. So if there are ligand molecules traveling inside the tissue or they're present inside the tissue, they can actually get trapped in the ECM network, they get lodged onto the fibers and then they can signal in the cells that they want to act upon. So that's an ex excellent theory and actually uh, there, were, there are reports that actually prove, you know, they prove this theory um, that uh, ECM molecules can actually uh, help in the lodging of the ligand molecules. 
Now, one of the molecules that is involved in uh, the spreading stability and activity of one, one such ligand, that is the DPP signaling pathway ligand DPP, is DLP, which is dairy like protein, which is a heparin sulfate proteome ligand. It is one of the key components that functions in the DPP signaling pathway, and it associates with the ECM molecule, and it is required for sequestering these signaling lig ligands that then support stemness. So what we did is we looked at the expression of the dairy-like protein in the control and upon knockdown of beta antibin and the prohemocytes, and we see that the DLP expression is drastically affected. So now you can see this nice apical uh, meshwork kind of pattern, which was very similar to the beta integrin pattern that you observed earlier. We see that that is affected uh, if you knock down beta integrin in the prohemocyte. So this shows that DLP uh, is downregulated, which in turn could affect uh, the ECM, which, which could be one of the reasons that the ECM is affected and the signaling around the prohemocyte is affected. So what we did is we looked at the downstream effect of the DPP signaling. Pathway, that is phosphomad. We see that the phosphomad levels are reduced upon not only beta integrin knockdown but also upon collagen knockdown in the prohemocytes. In both these cases, we find that the phosphomad levels are less. And now, like we, uh, when we do the classical genetic experiment, when we overexpress the DPP signaling ligand in the beta integrin knockdown uh, prohemocytes, we see that we can rescue the phenotype of beta integrin. Knockdown. Now, this experiment is very similar to the PAT experiment, but here what we are trying to look at is the ligand acceptance in the ECM molecules. And when essentially, when you perturb beta integrin, there is no more ECM that is there to hold or sequester the ligands, which is also aided by molecules like DLP, like I just mentioned. And when you then supply this ligand externally, so what we did is we overexpressed the secretory form of DPP in the beta integrin knockdown background. And when you provide uh, ectopically the ligand uh, in, the, in these particular cells, you can see that the phenotype of uh, increased differentiation can now be rescued, which goes to show that uh, integrin molecules are functioning in two different ways. One is by regulating the direct downstream signaling mediated by PAC, and the other way is by regulating the signaling milieu that could be maintained by the ECM molecules or the proteoglycan molecules that associate, it, that associate with ECM, and integrin plays a very important function in regulating this signaling value. So to summarize uh, these two stories that I, so uh, the integrin story, uh, story was just published last year in Current Biology, and uh, this is a summary of uh, these two stories wherein uh, there is cell to ECM interaction that is mediated by integrins, cell-to-cell -cell interactions that are mediated by molecules like septate junctions, and both these molecules are responsive uh, to external stress. They can switch, and if you perturb them, uh, they can completely switch hematopoiesis in the direction of, uh, as a stress response, which gives you a very good handle to analyze hematopoiesis in a developmental scenario and in a disease scenario. So essentially what we show here is that cell to cell, cell, to cell molecules and cell to ECM molecules like septate junctions and integrins, they maintain the architecture of the knee stem cell environment and they regulate the signaling environment around the niche and stem cells. So now what we've been doing in, in my lab uh, for the past one year that I've started in uh, March 2020 amidst the pandemic, of course, things have been slow, but we've started with some interesting stuff in the lab. And I will just give you a gist of what we've been doing and some preliminary data that we have that we have so so far in this in these particular directions. So one of the uh, ways by which stem cells or their environment could be affected is by aging. Aging is one of the primary uh, primary you know uh, reasons for a lot of disorders occurring inside the cell and leading to a lot of conditions, physiological disorders in organisms. So what we have tried to do is we have tried to create a genetic model of aging by accelerating aging and by reversing aging. So uh, we stall the aging or reverse age in the case of the reverse aging approach. And in these two approaches, we, we take uh, different ways uh, or approaches again, sub approaches you can say, wherein we do a whole organism specific approach. And we also do a very blood system specific approach wherein you perturb these molecules specifically in the hematopoietic system. So you can call it a cellular approach. In the case of accelerating aging, you can essentially induce chronic inflammation by overactivating the immune pathways, which mimics uh, 
uh, aging, accelerated aging in the organism, or you can also increase the amount of uh, production of reactive oxygen species. In the case of reverse aging, you can overexpress molecules like FOXO, which function downstream of the insulin signaling pathway, or by activation of autophagy, which is one of the primary mechanisms for regulating cellular and uh, protein homeostasis inside the cell. So you can activate autophagy and that's how you can reverse age. So we took these two approaches and then we looked at a number of phenotypes in our own plan. So firstly, when we look at the mutants of the uh, overactivation of the TOL or the IMD pathway, so we looked at two different mutants. We looked at the DNA damage essentially because aging can induce DNA damage in the cells. So we looked at the lymph gland and we looked at DNA damage by looking at the gamma H2X foci formation in the lymph gland. What we see is that as compared to the control, when you have chronic inflammation in the lymph glands, in the entire organism actually, in the case of tall mutants and the PERC, which is the negative uh, regulator of the IMD pathway, we see that there are there is increased amounts of DNA damage as compared to the control, which also translates to increased amounts of differentiation in these two mutants as compared to the control. So this goes to show that inflammation mediated by chronic immune activation is leading to DNA damage. We are validating these findings now with, um, uh, with different approaches. And uh, uh, we see that the homeostatic balance is lost when you uh, accelerate aging by inducing chronic inflammation. Now we also uh, did, did, did this with, uh, with a chemical called as HU. We treated the larvae with HU and we, so this is a, this induces DNA damage essentially. And this very well mimics the genetic scenario wherein we see that there is increased DNA damage in the lymph gland in the larvae treated with HU as compared to the mock treated larvae. We see that there is increased amounts of HU and there is increased amounts of both plasmatocyte and crystal cell differentiation as compared to the control. So HU-induced DNA damage is inducing differ differentiation, which mimics the inflammaging situ situation, which is induced by activating the immune pathways. Now we've not limited ourselves to the hematopoietic system. We are also looking at other stem cell systems in Drosophila. We are looking at uh, the gut stem cells, the intestinal stem cells essentially, which are marked here by escargot GFP which is a molecule that is expressed in the intestinal stem cells and the enteroblasts, so which, are, which is marked here in green. And the, the foci in red, again, are the gamma H2X foci. So in a normal scenario, we do not find uh, the expression of gamma H2X or the presence of gamma H2X foci in, a, in, in the wild type scenario in these intestinal stem cells or enteroblasts. But what happens when you uh, induce inflammation aging is that when you activate the tall pathway or the IMD pathway in the mid-gut, specifically using the escargot galpol, which is expression specific to the intestinal stem cells, we, we start finding the presence of these uh, foci, gamma H2X foci, also in the intestinal stem cells, which goes to show that inflammation aging induced specifically in the intestinal stem cells is driving DNA damage in the intestine. So now we are, again, in this scenario as well, we are looking at a number of downstream uh, signaling pathways that could be affected. We're looking at DNA damage repair genes and uh, other uh, pathways uh, related to uh, this particular phenotype that we're observing. Whereas if you do the opposite in the case of lymph gland, wherein you activate a molecule that would activate autophagy by expressing a molecule like ATG8, we find that there is no effect on differentiation. In fact, in one of the lineages in the case of crystal cells, we find that there is suppression of differentiation as compared to the control. Whereas differentiation in the case of plasmatocytes is more or less similar. We, we, we need to uh, get this quantitated as well in order to uh, see whether this is a significant uh, phenotype that we observe in terms of suppression. But we find that uh, overactivation of molecules involved in the autophagy pathway or uh, insulin pathway essentially, which would be an anti-aging approach, reinforces stem cell self renewal and it uh, sort of suppresses differentiation as compared to the other approach wherein when you accelerate aging, it uh, increases the amount of differentiation. The other, uh, the other line of work or the aim that our lab is pursuing is uh, since we are at a cancer institute and we have uh, great clinicians working here, working on different kinds of cancers, uh, where we can collaborate with the clinicians. Uh, we, 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 initiate, we have initiated this project on cancer cachexia, 
which is a condition of degeneration that occurs in the case of advanced stages of cancer. So in this case, uh, essentially what happens is there is organ wasting and uh, muscle wasting that occurs in the organism, which leads to uh, starvation and production of, uh, there's also lipolysis, production of inflammatory cytokines, which then leads to a deterioration of the conditions in the case of patients. And it is one of the primary reasons for mortality, actually. So one can create a Drosophila model of cachexia by inducing tumors in the epithelia, either in the intestine or in the imaginal disc, and it very nicely mimics the condition of cachexia. So we are trying to understand the correlation between this condition of cachexia and hematopoiesis. What happens to the hematopoietic system in conditions of cachexia? How are the blood cells interacting with the tumor cells? And are they acting as a regulator of this cachexic scenario? of worsening the scenario in the case of cachexia because blood cells produce a number of compounds and molecules. So whether or not, firstly, whether the tumor and cachexia affects the hematopoietic system and whether the hematopoietic system has any effect on the tumor as such. So it's a bi-directional crosstalk that we are essentially planning to look at. And this is the other aim that currently we've been pursuing at Actric in my lab. So yeah, these, uh, these are the research directions that I have been working at in Actric. Uh, our lab is new. We've been there for a year, uh, just for a year, under a year, and uh, it's it's been specifically hard, you know, starting a lab amidst a pandemic. But we are always we are open for collaborations. We love to hear from all sorts of people. Uh, we love to explore different ideas. We are not limited to what uh, to the research direction which we're looking at. And I firmly believe that biology is complex, and effort to understand its functioning has, cannot be individualistic. It has to be a concerted effort, which can be fueled by collaborations and working on multiple systems. And that's why we are also initiating collaborative projects here in Actric on uh, mice models as well as patient samples. So this has been my small but very lovely group, I would say. Uh, great individuals helping me in setting up the lab and uh, you know getting the projects going. I would specifically like to thank uh, Saraswati and Kishale, whose data I presented today. And they've been instrumental in setting up these projects. And Arjun and Vipassana, who were trainers in the lab. And uh, I would really like to thank my students, Actrek for the funding and the central facilities, my collaborators at IIT Gandhi Nagar, TIF, Hyderabad, and NCL. Uh, I've been funded by the DBT Hargobind Purana IYB Award and Ramalinga Swami. I would like to thank my mentors, uh, without whom uh, it wouldn't have been possible to. Uh, you know, start this journey in research all by myself. They've been instrumental in guiding me throughout. Specifically, like to thank uh, Professor Manisha Inamda, my PhD mentor, my postdoc mentor, Guy Zap, and uh, Professor Imaris Rao, who have been really instrumental in shaping my scientific understanding, my temperament, and in general, my journey throughout. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, feel free to engage anytime. I would love to hear from you. I'm also there on LinkedIn. And now I am ready to take any questions that you might have. Uh, I would love to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kadilka. That was a lovely talk. You really summarized a lot of things. You covered a lot of ground. I especially liked the um, the experiments involving the beta subunit knockdown in pre homocytes and how you showed the FAC is working in the integrin pathways. And I absolutely love that you are going in the direction of aging. That is one of the topics that I really like to explore. But before I take any question, I really have to ask you. So amongst all these proteins with interesting names, which one is your favorite? <laughs> I think the septate junction ones. For a <laughs> is my favorite name. Yeah. Okay. It, it sounds so artistic. Yeah. Now we know your favorite. All right. <laughs> So I think we'll start taking questions from Hemant Khanna. If I'm not wrong, Dr. Khanna is a faculty member at the UMass Medical School. Um, he's asking, does the protein conformation affect trafficking through the junctions? Uh, protein conformation of any ligand molecule, probably. That's what he means. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, protein conformation can affect the trafficking through uh, tight junctions because they have a molecular cutoff firstly. And uh, so the size is limiting. Uh, the kind of molecules that can pass through the junctions is they're very selective and uh, they have a molecular cutoff. And it is different in the case of Drosophila and in the case of vertebrates. So in the case of vertebrates, the molecular cutoff might be different as compared to flies. 
So that is one one aspect of it, and the other is uh, definitely if the protein conformation changes, it can definitely uh, have an effect on whether or not it can pass through the junctions. So that is an interesting thing that I that we've not really looked into, but I can uh, I my guess is conformation can affect uh, the trafficking of the junctions. He had a second question asking: Does barrier breakdown affect phagosome clearance or uptake? Is there an effect on autophagy? Uh, yeah, so one of the things, like I said, we observed is the effect on phagocytosis, uh, phagocytosis of these hemocytes when there is a barrier breakdown. So essentially, uh, the lymph gland is not having uh, the, or the blood cells are not having the barrier anymore. The separate junction components are downregulated, uh, which is leading to an increased amount of phagocytosis. Now, what we've not really looked at is whether the cytoskeletal organization in these cells is affected because that could be one of the reasons why the phagocytic uptake is increasing because uh, the amount of phylopodial uh, extensions that these hemocytes can form could be modulated by septate junctions. And since these junctions are getting modulated, it could also lead to, a, you know, a acquisition of a character which is more migratory in nature, something similar on the lines of epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Though this is not really an epithelial organ, but it behaves like an epithelial organ because it has these nice uh, junctions present between the cells. So, uh, yeah, we've looked at the output in terms of phagocytic uptake, but we've not really looked at whether the machinery is affected. And to answer your second question, uh, autophagy, we've not looked at whether autophagy is affected when you affect the septate, uh, septate junctions. It's an interesting question again because... Uh, the autophagy is one of the clearly one of the main mechanisms of maintaining cellular homeostasis, and it could likely be affected when you modulate septate junctions. But I am not aware of any direct connection between any autophagy molecule and the septate junction components. All right, um, we're going to take the next question. Bishudip Ghoshroy has a question Does this uh, septate junction affect the tumor microenvironment? Okay. So, of course, it does. I mean, uh, tight junctions are there everywhere. If you're talking about the vertebrate or the tumor in, in my microenvironment in the humans, uh, there are a number of cell types present in the microenvironment. Uh, in the case of, especially in the in the case of epithelial tumors, you would expect high expression of uh, tight junctions. And in the case of tumors, this uh, these junctions are likely to be broken down which will definitely affect the signals. So I, I, I don't know if there is any already any report on how uh, tight junctions modulate the tumor microenvironment. But again, my guess is that they are most likely to be there present and modulate signaling in the microenvironment. All right. We have a question from Shronak Shahu. Um, does bacterial infection affects PSC cell proliferation and does that correlate with the cell cycle timings? So, yeah, so what we have, uh, in some of my earlier reports, I, we have already reported that infection does affect uh, PSC cell proliferation. We do see that there is there are increased amounts of these cells present upon infection, but we have not really looked at the cell cycle machinery in the case of PSC. What we know is that they are mitotically active, but we have not gone deep mechanistically looking at the cell cycle in the PSC cells. And uh, it could be one of the interesting avenues that one could look at uh, as a response to infection because there is a lot of activity going on in the hematopoietic organ once there is infection because you have to produce these rapid amounts of uh, differentiated cells. So there is not only onset of differentiation, increased amounts of differentiation, but we also see that uh, there are increased amounts of mitotically active cells. So yeah, to answer your uh, question, Sean, yeah, we do see that. All right. The next question is from Smita Chaudhary. Um, she's asking, is it possible to overexpress adherence and tight junction to overcome septate junction loss? Yeah. So, uh, Smita, very nice question. Uh, one of our reviewer questions, actually. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we've done uh, we've done this experiment in our study that was published in eLife. Uh, it's one of the figures there. I have not, I'm not, I didn't present it today in the interest of time, but we've tried to overexpress septate junctions. Uh, thankfully, being in the Drosophila, using the Drosophila system, we were able to, like, you name any molecule whether you want to overexpress or downregulate, and we could get the tools for it. 
So we did overexpress tight junctions, and we see that the barrier loss could be repaired by overexpression of tight junction components. So, yeah. All right, that's good to know. Maybe she was one of the reviewers. You never know. <laughs> Um, okay, um, Shanchari Garai is asking, can we implicate this study by down-regulating the niche stem cell barrier to up-regulate it, up-regulate the hematopoietic stem cells to proliferate the immune cells to fight with the cancer in case of human? Okay, so yeah, I think this is a very general question. Uh, I would answer in, in a way that, I mean, if you if you're talking about inbuilt immuno this is essentially inbuilt immunotherapy where you want to model the stem cell niche barrier in such a way that you upregulate immune cells but uh, one caution here is if you upregulate the amount of immune cells invariably you could also induce a situation of increased inflammation which could be harmful to the host itself i mean you might end up killing the tumor cells but again how do you make these tumor cells specific to the cancer cell so you will have to, like one has to engineer the tumor cells in such a way that they can target the tumor cells specifically and to avoid the scenario where the host cells are not attacked by their own cells. Either. So uh, because increased inflammation, like we see in the case of COVID right now, a cytokine storm can create havoc in the body. So uh, this is also a scenario that one needs to take care of. All right. We have a lot more questions, but I'll just take two more in the interest of time. So we have a question from Bishwadeep Ghoshra again. Does the DNA repair affects the phagocytosis, which leads to aging or ECM homeostasis? Okay, so I I don't think there is a correlation between DNA repair and phagocytosis, at least something that's not reported so far. But uh, we do, like I said, we see DNA damage in the lymph gland when we are inducing aging. So it definitely has a correlation with aging and ECM homeostasis like he's mentioning. But uh, I don't think, at least not in my knowledge right now, that there is a cor direct correlation between repair and phagocytosis. All right. We're going to finish off with one last question from Dr. Hemant Khanna. What are your, like, if you have plans to validate the findings in a mammalian system? Yeah, so we are actually looking at, uh, we, we are trying to do this in a tumor model, actually, in an oral cancer model in the mice, in, in the case of mice, where we'll be looking at uh, tight junctions, uh, the role of tight junctions in tumorigenesis. So there we plan to look at the barrier function and uh, how the signals are affected in an oral cancer model. So we plan to do this both in a genetic model as well as uh, in the carcinogen-induced oral cancer model in the case of mice. So that is one of the things in the pipeline that we would be starting soon. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Khadilkar. It was, it was a excellent talk. We get to learn a lot about your research and your journey. Um, yeah, I mean, if you, before finishing off, um, if you like, because we also have like uh, people listening in from different stages of their career, if you would like to um, say a few words about your journey from becoming from a postdoc to becoming an independent group leader in India and how that transition was for you. Sure. Uh, I think it, one of the main things that one has to remember is, I mean, if you're planning to transition back to India or in academia in general is planning ahead and organizing yourself. I think identifying when you have to start applying for academic positions is, is one of the key things that one has to really, you know, uh, make your mind and you have to start applying. Putting yourself together and putting your uh, research proposal together is one of the most important things that, at least in my experience, and, you know, there is never a right time or uh, you should never wait for the right time to arrive for you to start applying. Uh, one of my experiences has been as soon as you have a publication from your uh, postdoc, one publication and you're good to go. If it's a it's, if it's decent amount of work published in a, you know, in a in a respectable journal, it need not be really very high impact, even if you're applying in India, because now the scenario is changing a lot. Even in India, you would at least land a job talk because the awareness has increased much more as compared to earlier times. People are now looking at the quality of the work you do rather than just the impact factor of the work uh, or the journal that you publish in. So I think uh, understanding that and then coming up with identifying areas that are very novel to, uh, to the institutes because you have to bring something new to the table. 
So that is uh, one of the key things that you have to really come up with a really great research proposal. And you have to let your ideas and train work in all sorts of direction and uh, come up with a fabulous idea that would, uh, you know, uh, lower the committee that is going to uh, look at the faculty applications and then you land a job talk. And then the ball is in your court, actually. In my experience, it took me around two years to land a position that I made after multiple job talks. And it's it's not always about the quality of your application or, you know, your profile or something. You have to be a right fit at the institute. Maybe you are not, uh, your research area is not the research area that the institute is looking for at that particular moment. So even though you've done great, you might have good publications, great profile, but just that the institute is looking for something else at that point. So don't get disheartened by rejections. Uh, that that is part and parcel of this game. You just have to move ahead, give as many talks as you can, and uh, I think you are you're bound to get one of them. You, definitely, it's it's a thing that can be cracked. Yeah. So yeah, that that's that's been my experience. All right. So right place at the right time, just like all of you are right now listening to Dr. Khadilka's awesome talk. Um, all right. Thank you again. Thank you so much. We learned a lot, not only about science, but also about the scientific journey, which is really important. And thank you again. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, yeah. Uh, anyone attending, if you have any more questions, since we were not able to take all of the questions today, feel free to just message me on Twitter or LinkedIn, and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm sure you are also actively recruiting for your lab. So if any student Absolutely. is interested in yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, for and thank you to the organizers again for the for this opportunity. Really. Absolutely, we are privileged to have you on our platform. All right, thank you. We'll catch up soon. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining in today. Um, we truly appreciate your support and participation. Please keep continuing supporting us and following us on Twitter and subscribing our YouTube channel. Um, we had a great time. Hope you did. You did too. Um, we'll see you soon.